Welcome to the Association 4.0 podcast, your association's no-fluff playbook to navigating and thriving in Industry 4.0 or the digital marketplace. Each week, we bring expert insights to help you and your association stay ahead of the curve. Hello, my name is Sherry Budziak, and I am the host of the Association 4.0 podcast. I'm also a co-founder of .org Community and founder and CEO of .org Source, a consultancy to associations. Today, my guest is Elizabeth Lepkowski. Elizabeth is a chief learning officer at the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. She has also served as director of education at the American Society of Anesthesiologists and e-learning manager at the American College of Chest Physicians. Welcome, Elizabeth. Um, I'm glad you're here and anxious to hear your thoughts on education in the association industry and how programs are growing and changing in today's environment. Great. Thank you for having me, Sherry. So tell us a little bit about your your audience, about yourself and your organization. You and I have known each other for quite some time, um, but uh, if you can talk to our audience a little bit about your background would be great. Sure. Well, like you, like you said, I've worked in for the past several years in medical and healthcare associations. And before that, I was in government. So a totally different type of nonprofit industry, um, but always had some sort of training or education in my background. I have a husband and three teenagers. So we have a very busy household. And at ACE, I've been chief learning officer for the past four years, where I oversee all of the education program development, clinical practice guidelines, and our two medical journals. Our organization at ACE focuses on clinical endocrinology. So our members are endocrinologists, diabetes educators, pharmacists, Uh, family physicians, MPs, PAs, or anyone in that clinical space that focuses on um, diabetes or endocrine patients. Uh, Many of our patients, um, you know, we're a small association and many of our patients um, sort of came to the forefront over the last couple of years during the pandemic because many of the patients that ended up in the ICU and very chronically ill um, had underlying endocrine conditions. And so our members and our education we provide and resources we provide have become more important than ever. And so our association, although we're a small association, uh, we've become very important in the healthcare community. So talk to me a little bit, you know, education plays a huge role in all associations. And how do you see the members' educational priorities changing? Um, And what is ACE doing to help meet these needs? So interesting, we just had a little over a week ago, our first in-person annual meeting. It was the first one we had had since May 2019. So way before the pandemic, even, you know, we even knew what COVID was. And um, was interesting. We we had great attendance. Uh, we knew it was going to be a little bit smaller than what we were used to in the past, uh, mostly because international attendees are still finding it very challenging um, to move about and travel uh, like we, we are in the U.S. Um, but people were just so happy to be there in person. You know, folks that I've worked with virtually or over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. They were just so excited to finally meet us. We've been working together so closely for the last couple of years and just everyone was so excited to be there. Um, But a lot of the feedback we got was um, you don't realize the fatigue you feel working in a virtual environment. I think we all were forced to do it because we didn't have a choice to have that in-person connection in conferences like we're all used to having. Um, But some of the other things that we noticed is that just the importance of networking and doing some of the types of education that you really don't get the same experience doing it virtually or over Zoom or in a virtual event platform. So I think the 
the things that associations are really going to have to wrestle with you know, is what is our new normal? You know, I don't think any of us can assume we just go back to the pre-pandemic era and nobody really knows what the new normal is going to be. You know, there's we're such a global community. Associations are all of us have sort of a global outlook and mission and vision. And so there's many parts of the world that are still very impacted by COVID and still will be for a long time. And so how do we reach out to those members? How do we keep those connections? How do we provide a sense of safety and well-being for all of our members, not just those that are able to now travel to in-person conferences? And then what is the financial stability of all of this? So I think all associations are going to have to wrestle with what is our new normal and what works for our association and our members? So Elizabeth, did the pandemic create any permanent changes in the way that your program is operating? So um, yes, definitely. Uh, I think all of us could say there's there were definitely both temporary pivots, but also some permanent changes. Um, For one, our association became a totally virtually association by choice. Uh, We are not going back to the office. We have let that space um, go. And so um, where I think a lot of associations have built, you know, large, um, you know, training facilities or office spaces, we are a totally virtually operating organization. I have team members just in my department that are in all four domestic time zones. (laughs) So um, we were starting to talk about going in this direction before March, 2020. And so it really escalated those plans. Um, But we actually compared to maybe some larger associations that didn't allow at home work or remote working yet, um, we actually had a pretty easy uh, pivot towards this working environment because we were already operationalizing those plans anyway. It just sort of escalated those plans and we, we proved that we could do it. Um, so I think how we operate is definitely different. Um, We also are just really looking at the overall education guideline journal operations and how we develop content to make sure that nothing is falling through the cracks, that teams are not working in silos. I think one thing in building a whole new virtual team and getting everyone to work together. I still have team members that have worked together for two and a half years and never met once in person. Wow. And so how you make sure those social and emotional connections are still, there's opportunities to have that because everyone knows during the pandemic, there was a lot of conflict resolution that had to happen. There was a lot of nimbleness that was required. There was, I think everyone hates the word pivot now because we've heard it so many times. (laughs) Um, But to get everyone to work together seamlessly when they've never met in person, I think we've, we've done a really good job. And one of the things I learned to build a virtual team is that over, you can't understate communication. I know it sounds like something that's overplayed and we all talk about the importance of communication, but the ability to communicate really, really well and to communicate many, many times, because Mm -hmm. you can't always assume that everyone read something the same way. You can't assume that everyone keeps up with email and meeting invites and all those things the same way you do or another team member does. So over-communicating is very, very important. Um, I also think just little things like I'm in central time zone, putting an 8.30 a.m. appointment on everyone's calendar doesn't work. 
because I have several people on the West Coast. Not really fair to Mm -hmm. ask people that have young children at home to be on Zoom at 6.30 a.m. every Monday morning, (laughs) so where others have been up for hours. And so there's things like that that you you learn to how to work with it and what works for your team, but having a lot of empathy, especially those that are in supervisory or leadership roles, you really, your team and building the right team and having staff in the right roles is really, really important and making sure everyone has the right information and knows exactly what to do. That makes all of the success, the actual how you do something or what you do, that is almost secondary to having the right staff in the right roles and having really clear communication and guidance for everyone. Yeah, you brought up a couple of things that resonate with me. I, at one point, um, I even had to tell our consulting team, you know, people are going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. And where we used to kind of like pause and you would walk in a room and I'd be like, hey, Elizabeth, what's going on? You know, how's this going? Going Well, we were just going from meeting agenda to meeting agenda. So being intentional on taking those pauses to create uh, those connections that some organizations have lost sight of. And for other people, it's very hard to work in a remote environment. So I know you've done a great job of creating that team and and teamwork, but you have to be very intentional about it, which takes thought and, and time. And to your point too, you might have somebody on the East Coast and somebody on Mountain Time and and us being on Central Time, it's like, oh yeah, we can do that, call it at five o'clock, four o'clock. And then you realize, well, on the East Coast, like they should probably be getting ready for dinner, right? <laughs> like, so you kind of have to really think through the day and, and your work day. And I know you've, you guys have done a, a really great job of doing that, which to me provides you and ACE the opportunity to find great employees all over, you know, wherever they might be, right? Because they don't have to physically go into the office. So there's there's giving you guys that that opportunity as well. Um, so another question that I have for you is, you know, medical organizations have highly evolved education programs. What can other groups learn from the way that you guys deliver continuing education? So I think um, just building on um, the importance of having really good qualified staff is also empower your staff to try new things. I think with us having a smaller association and maybe being a little, a little progressive compared to some really, you know, older established traditional associations, um, we've really tried to empower staff to try new things we've allowed them to take some risks without afraid of out being a without being afraid of failure um i think that's been a very interesting um thing that's evolved on our team is that you know some folks they've maybe started with us year and a half two years ago and as we've allowed them to have a little bit of creative freedom really treating everyone, like everyone is equal and everyone is a grown adult. Your job in working in a fully virtual organization is you have to manage your schedule. You have to attend meetings when they're required. But if you choose to work at 10 p.m. at night because you're a night owl and that's your best thinking, that's fine. If you're better at 6 a.m. to answer all your emails because you're a morning person and once you get that cup of coffee going, your brain is going, that's okay too. And so I think really empowering your staff to manage their time and their schedule as long as all the deadlines are being made and the goals are being accomplished, um, I think that's been a real way to help evolve the quality of our programs and the innovation in our products. Um, I think the other things that have just evolved is the ability to know that PowerPoint is not everything. (laughs) At our our medical conference this year, you know, we kind of started everyone off with the big plenary talks, the big speaker names. And yes, there was a lot of PowerPoint during those times, 
but we really tried some new things. So we tried some new games and we tried some new um, skills development workshops that we hadn't really had the opportunity to do since, since our team was built in the last couple of years. And those were the things that people are talking about now, even though the conference was a couple of weeks ago. And so I think those are the things we're going to continue to work on, grow, and evolve. Um, and those were all things that came from staff driven ideas, not directors, not chief level officers, like the doers on the team came up with those ideas and executed them very, very well. And it got leadership's attention on site, like, oh, this is really cool. Glad we are doing this. So I think those have been kind of the interesting things that we've evolved both from an education program development staff standpoint and a staff development standpoint. Well, it sounds, you know, the, the, the conversation that I'm having with execs right now is all around member engagement and experience. And it sounds like you guys have been able to test some of those things out and, and been very effective in, in doing so. It's great to hear um, they're talking about it after the conference, right? Because you want to create that experience for them that they remember and then obviously they'll want to return the next time at, um, from having that experience. So that that's fantastic. Yeah. So Elizabeth, what is the biggest technology advancements in your uh, organization right now? Well, as you know, because you've you you and your business has helped us with this the last few <laughs> years, but. Um, the last couple of years, we've really went through a digital strategy project where we've kind of had to upgrade everything from soup to nuts, from website development to um, an AMS to launching our new learning management system, which I know isn't necessarily um, the biggest technology advancement out there in education, but The timing was uh, kind of everything. We launched it on March 1st in 2020, and then the world shut down like a few days later. It was perfect timing, that's for sure. (laughs) Yes, and so, but it allowed us to rapidly develop a whole slew of online education products that if we hadn't had that in place at that time, there's, I mean, we would have, just really been stuck on what to do. And we wouldn't have been able to um, do anything the last couple of years. Um, So that has been a big advancement that we've been able um, to evolve. I think the other thing um, that we've been able to do pretty well, it was pretty scary, the first one we did. um, But I've I feel like it's a well-oiled machine now is mastering the virtual event experience. And I know it still probably has a a little bit of a ways to go, but um, that's something that we were forced to learn during the last couple of years. Um, But it's actually something with some of our early career trainee folks that we're going to continue those. Those are actually not going to be... um, reverting back to pre-pandemic days. I think we're going to continue to keep those virtual events um, because that we found that uh, they can be more cost effective for the number of speakers that we need to produce those events. Um, we've been able to get it down. I think we we were so nervous the first couple that we probably had triple the staff we really need online and everyone was clearing their calendars for a week. And now it's like, we've got it down to handful of staff need to be available because now we are really familiar with how to do everything. Uh, and now it's just making small tweaks every year. And so we've really been able to reduce overhead costs and you know out-of-pocket costs where pre-pandemic, those were pretty expensive out-of-pocket programs for us, where, you know, margin maybe could have been been better. And now, you know, we're able to grow those programs in a totally different way by having those virtual events continue in that format. 
So I guess to follow up on that, do you see technology changing the way that you deliver programming in the future? I think so. As we're as we're looking at you know some new strategies for as we've been saying like what's our new normal, uh, just coming out of our annual meeting, you know, there's a lot of our speakers and faculty and members that they're so used to the 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 online platforms now and Zoom and Teams and pre recording talks, you know, mm-hmm. before they go live and. So I think we're trying to figure out how it doesn't need to be one or the other, but how do we sort of merge the experiences and merge the strategies together? So that way, for those that are going to choose to come to in-person conferences, what is that experience that you can't get by sitting in your office or in your bedroom on your laptop or on your phone that will cause you to spend the money to travel to those in-person conferences because you can't get it at home. Right. And so that way it doesn't have to be all lecture based and all PowerPoint versus, you know, we were forced to have that with virtual events. So how can we kind of mesh the two experiences together? I think the technology has advanced rapidly over the last couple of years because all the technology companies realized they're in high demand. There's a high need for this. And so they had to, they had to evolve. They had to innovate. And so now we're looking at how do we use the technology to sort of set the stage, how to set the foundational knowledge, skills development, experience before someone is going to choose to travel to the in-person conference. So that way the experience on site is something totally unique and totally different and somewhere, something that they can't get somewhere else. Yeah. So the, um, I guess, what challenges and opportunities do you see um, today in the area of education? So I think um, as we've been talking about this and figuring out what the new normal is, I think we're definitely going to see a lot less lecture-based, a lot of of less didactic-based experiences, more immersive experiences. Those are the things that you can't get the same way in a virtual experience or just re-watching a video. Uh, So I think that is going to continue to evolve. And that's challenging because it means that your members and your staff have to work together in a different way and figure out what is the framework to develop those experiences. And how does that then play into skills development for the faculty, skills development for the staff that need to support and help develop those experiences? And what what is the impact on the finances that are required to support those experiences? I think continuing to use digital tools to connect members to the broader community with things like online platforms. And also, um, we've been talking some about how do we better incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion, and a feeling of community of support and sense of well, of be of belonging into our experiences. I, I, I think those are all things that an association being a very mission driven organization, those are very important and they're not easy answers. And I think everyone has a different type of membership and everyone, there's not one answer for that. So every, you know, every audience kind of has different priorities when it comes to DNI and sense of belonging. So really understanding what your members want and need and trying to mirror that and meet those needs, whether it's, whether it's, you know, for online education or some sort of new program development or conferences that are in person. I think all those things um, are things that associations are going to have to wrestle with. So what do you feel is the most important things that leaders can do right now to position their organizations for success? Well, I think employees are the most important capital that associations have. I know a lot of people would say their members are, but 
you know, really create the experiences and the resources that make members want to belong. Your employees are your human capital that are really most important and make sure, making sure that you have the right team and the right staff and the right positions doing the right things. I think that can't be, um, I think that is just something that can't be ignored or undervalued. I know from an HR perspective and a leader perspective, you know, we hear a lot about the great resignation in, in a hub like Chicago, where there's literally thousands of associations if your association doesn't align with employees sort of core values and needs, they'll just go somewhere else. Right. And, um, you know, we, I read something in Harvard business review recently that, you know, there's a lot of organizations that have experienced in the last two years, 40% turnover. Mm -hmm. And so I've been fairly fortunate to have very little turnover during the last couple of years but a lot of associations are trying to wrestle with how, how do we stop this? Because if you don't have, you don't have the staff to do what you need to meet the members needs, then that becomes a huge problem and a huge gap for your association management team. So I think that that can't be um, underplayed. Well, Elizabeth, you know, I've worked with you at all the, organizations that we talked about with CHEST and ASA. And I will say, I've always been very impressed with the way that you have coached and mentored and managed your teams. And it's shown that you've been then able to successfully advance programs that, that you're trying to, to do and advance the organization. So, um, so kudos to you because you, um, you've, you've done a great job. And I think that is really good advice. Do you feel that the association business models are changing? I know that, you know, at ACE, we worked with you. You guys have some great senior team members there, and you guys are very innovative and forward thinking. And so I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on whether or not you feel that the business model is changing, or maybe it's not. I guess love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, we talk about this uh, all the time, and I think... Um, I think a lot of associations are wrestling with what is the value of their membership? Do traditional membership models, are they really valuable? Are they going to exist 10 years from now? Um, Me having three teenagers, one right after the other, um, I don't know in 10 years if they would actually pay a subscription to join something every year. You know, those are going to be our next, you know, generation of members and associations and how do we continue to reach them with models that feel timely, relevant, and contemporary. I think it's something that is definitely going to shift. Um, I think every association management team needs to look at what is the value proposition? How do we communicate it? What do our members really want and figure out what is the right model for them? I definitely think that that is something that's going to continue to shift and change, especially as the next generation enters the workforce. I totally agree. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for your time today. I know you're really busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to have us talk with you. Um, And I enjoyed hearing your perspective um, on all of these things related to uh, member, like I said, member engagement and experience and education and, and staff staffing It's all been great. Um, And thanks to our listeners today. And I hope you've benefited from Elizabeth's expertise Uh, to meet leaders like Elizabeth, consider joining dot org community Dot org community connects you with a vibrant network of association execs, entrepreneurs, and strategic partners. To learn more, you can reach us at www.orgcommunity.com. So again, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I really appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Sherry. We hope you enjoyed this episode and discovered tips and information that will add value to your leadership style and your association. 
Dot.org Source specializes in positioning teams for success with solutions for technology, strategy, and marketing. Please contact us at info at orgsource.com or visit www.orgsource.com to find out how to keep your organization on track to Association 4.0.